welcome back. Now we're going to be proceeding in one of my favorite topics of DNA and this is chapter six and we're going to kind of go over uh, some topics here. Let me uh, get us there. We're going to talk about what DNA is and what it does. You probably already know. Uh, we're going to explain some of the processes of how the DNA is expressed and the units that express certain things that may represent proteins or rec regulatory type things are called genes. Explain the causes and effects of damage, uh, mutations to the genetic code. We'll talk a little bit about biotech in agriculture, but we have a whole chapter devoted to biotechnology. And then we'll talk about <clears throat> excuse me, some of the implications for human health. So let's get started. So there's a, a technology called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. We'll talk about this some in lab. But PCR allows us to do lots of things. Uh, one of the things that uh, PCR does is amplifies DNA and then we can compare sequences. It's all about how it's amplified that allows us to do these things. So what's DNA and how we use it? Well, <clears throat> here's a uh, gentleman who was wrongly convicted of a crime and the only way he was freed after spending about 20 years in prison, which is just absurd, uh, he was wrongly uh, jailed and the, the PCR technology uh, really proved the fact that he did not uh, uh, inflict the, the uh, what they say he had done because his DNA didn't match. And so this is not unique. There's many, many, many examples of using DNA evidence to free people. Uh, it's also used to convict, but it's also used to free those who uh, were did, did not do the crime. So <clears throat> they have uh, DNAs in the news, various things, uh, behavior partly due to their genes according to these di dictators and things. And too many one night stands blame your genes according to a new study of me. Be fair to say that while Jolly could help cheating, your particular genes did make things more difficult. You know, you can relate some behavioral, I guess is what they're saying, characteristics to the DNA, which are a little bit higher end in terms of just, it's not one pro, one gene, one enzyme, or one gene, one protein. These things could have effects emotionally, and uh, so they're kind of saying that. So DNA is a molecule that's in all living organisms. It carries almost every cell, 100 trillion cells. It's not in our red blood cells, but it's in uh, all the others. It contains instructions for the functions of every cell. Because every person's DNA is unique, and because we leave a trail of DNA behind us as we go about our lives, DNA can serve as an individual identifier, which is pretty cool. So understanding the DNA structure, that that was quite an undertaking. The ones that got uh, credit for this was uh, James Watson and Francis Crick. Well, uh, it's really interesting. You know I'm interested in DNA and models. You know I do 3D printing and the like. And I'm building a website uh, during this COVID stuff that if students want a model um, I'm, I'm going to set it up so uh, I can print them and mail them to you if you're interested in those sorts of things. And the cost of it is only to cover the PLA and uh, the shipping costs. And uh, so anyhow, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about making this available to, to my students. And so uh, James Watson and Francis Crick. Now Francis Crick is gone. James Watson's still around. You may have seen him on TV. I believe he's still around. I, I better check that before I say that. <laughs> he uh, is a little senile these days, but uh, that's just my opinion. But what uh, is really interesting, there were a lot of scientists <clears throat> vying for the discovery. And uh, Linus Pauling, which uh, he actually, he, he's a two-time Nobel laureate, came to NC State. I got a chance to meet him. 
Uh, really interesting fella. He's not very tall. He was like five foot two, which kind of shocked me. I just, you know, somebody famous like that, you expect, you know, seven foot tall, and, and no, it wasn't that way at all. Uh, really interesting. He gave a colloquium, and then we had dinner with him. And lucky me, I got to sit right next to him during one of the dinners. And it was really great uh, just to kind of talk to the man. I was hoping some of the Nobel Prize would leak on me, but it didn't. But the, the key, though, uh, it was impressive on the use of models. He had considered the three uh, backbone concept of DNA, which he was wrong, which we all know now. It's two backbone. You got the two uh, phosphate uh, backbones, as you see in the diagram here. That they, it's it's two, but uh, they used a model based on X-ray crystallography uh, to figure out the structure. And normally, you use today we use X-ray crystallography to create the model, but they were using that technique to dis discern the model. And I, I find that interesting. Now there is uh, some interesting facts behind this. Uh, of course, when this was uh, developed, first molecules of DNA passed down from parents to offspring. That is not an obvious comment. Uh, years and years ago, uh, the DNA, of course, we're going to talk about uh, Punnett squares and the like. and. Uh, how some of these concepts came about, they didn't understand in those days in the 1800s and early 1900s that DNA was the molecule that transferred this information. And so they understood there was some characteristics. So I always love history as it rolls into science and how it comes about. Uh, there's some really interesting observation. Uh, and it's all about understanding how DNA does what it does. And of course, uh, Linus Pauling, as I mentioned before, already had won a prize in chemistry for elucidating uh, structures, but uh, he was investigating a DNA. And of course, he came up with the three backbone concept. And what's nice about science is that everyone can have their proposals or ideas, as we've talked about, and have your theories and the like and then you ultimately prove or disprove it and his was disproven but it was all part of our knowledge base and understanding over time uh, and then simultaneously Maurice Wal uh, Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin in England devoted their now she was excellent Rosalind Franklin was really really good with x-ray crystallography and that's where you bombard a crystalline form of some compound that you want to look at and then you look at the signatures after you bombard it. So it, um, the electrons hit it and then it, it frees an electron off of whatever it is and you get its angles and then you got to calculate and figure out where the original uh, molecule was so you can, you can elucidate the shape. And it's not easy. It's a really complicated area. It still is to, to this day. I happen to know an X-ray crystallographer and uh, the science is really tough. I have a book on it, and I'm, I'm trying to understand some of the details. And it, it, it's it's fairly complicated, and it, it takes uh, years to learn how to do that. So anyhow, the truth of the matter is, and the way your book talks about it, uh, Watson and Craig they came up with a design, but they didn't have all of the critical pieces of the expert crystallography, so they sort of borrowed that's the nice word, Rosalind Franklin's work. Based on her uh, X-ray crystallography results, they were able to pin down the two backbone structure of DNA. And at first, it looks like Watson and Crick were going to get all the credit, but ultimately uh, she did get credit for her work in helping uh, to elucidate the structure of DNA. And uh, I just want to bring that up because, you know, it seems largely unfair. I, I worked with, uh, I worked for some time out at Birds Welcome and there was uh, Trudy, it was a lady, a, a really wonderful lady. She was a top-notch scientist and uh, then there was a lead scientist and they had done a lot of work on a particular new compound and they got the Nobel Prize or he got the Nobel Prize. But uh, she was also greatly involved in that research 
and was passed over for that Nobel Prize because, well, she was female. And unfortunately in those days, it was sort of, you know, it was science was sort of the, the gentleman science, and which is wrong. But uh, nevertheless, that's the way it was in those days. And uh, Hitchings, who was the lead scientist who got the Nobel Prize, refused to, to accept the prize unless uh, a, a treaty got the, the award as well. And it worked out that they both got it. And, you know, that's what it takes for changes like this to occur. Somebody needs to stand up and say, look, you know, this isn't right. Well, the same sort of thing happened, and Rosalind Franklin got the award uh, as well. And so, as it should be, and this is Rosalind Franklin, and she was, as again, an x-ray crystallographer, but she was an outstanding x-ray crystallographer, and um, which led to the discovery, of course, of the DNA, and Francis Crick and Watson got it, and Reese Wilkins shared the prize in medicine, and also uh, uh, Rosalind Franklin was added uh, later. Um, so... Uh, unfortunately that's just the way it is uh, and it's changing it's changed greatly now so that uh, you know there was just two just recently uh, got the Nobel Prize with CRISPR if I don't know if you saw that technology or heard about it we're going to talk about it and CRISPR is an amazing technology and uh, two women uh, discovered it and they got the Nobel Prize and so the, the, the things of the past are gone it's it really should be uh, uh, based on your abilities to do regardless of whatever the background so anyhow enough about that so the structure of DNA was uh, determined that we have two backbones and they're uh, anti-parallel we'll talk about what that means later but one straight up the other one's upside down I I'll just say that for right now and they're held the two strands are held together by bases and these bases are a's and t's and g's and c's adenine thymine guanines and cytosines and they have a chemical structure if you notice just in the drawing here there's some differences there's this blue one there's a larger one and then the smaller one well the smaller one has a larger name this is a pyrimidine and this is a purine and they bind, if you see, two hydrogen bonds where the, the uh, G's and C's have three. And subtle, but there is a significant uh, implications of that. And I'll talk about that later, but it, it, it will shock you. Uh, I like shocking my students. So DNA is uh, the name is deoxyribonucleic acid and it is a nucleic acid a macromolecule that stores information which is really interesting because now we have informational storage in the form of a chemical a sugar it consists of indiv individual units called a nucleotide which has three components a, a molecule of sugar a phosphate group and a nitrogen uh, containing molecule called the base so the base is the A's, T's, G's, and C's. Uh, the phosphate group is uh, what holds the backbone together and then the sugar uh, molecule. Uh, what exactly is a double helix? So that is that drawing that I just showed you. Uh, that that's what they refer to as a double helix. And because uh, each of them have a twist, a two strands, so hence double and their uh, backbones of the DNA which are very strong and uh, in lab I, I extract uh, DNA from strawberries and the reason I like to do that as a class experiment because I like to uh, uh, have that sugar uh, or the DNA I can uh, do some chemical treatments where I can spool it on the glass rod so you can actually see it and touch it it's pretty strong actually if you think of it individually weak as far as the phosphates but collectively very strong which is the case so uh, that's the structure of DNA and again we have the sugar phosphate backbones and then the bases and they are hydrophobic and the outer parts tend to be a little bit uh, hydrophilic which is really interesting and that contributes to its uh, rotational type of helical structure and uh, as you can see the phosphates the, the reason I say the two strands one strands upright you can see the phosphate group the other strand is 
literally upside down and hence the phosphate group designation is drawn upside down. That's why I like this drawing because it really does show you the anti-parallel nature of the DNA. And then a little bit more of the detail you can see the uh, phosphate backbones and then uh, the phosphate is a is a grow and then how the bases are attached um, and then how they uh, bind to each other through hydrogen bonding. So A's and T's have two, G's and C's have three hydrogen bonds. And so everything we talked about is coming, coming back. Uh, so alternating sugars and phosphates hold everything in place. They play only a supportive role. The rungs of the ladder are where things get interesting, attached to each sugar protruding like on that rung of the ladder called the base. So we have the A's, C's, C's, and G's as those bases. And then they interact with one another from one side to the other through the hydrogen bonding. And they have those about the strength of rubbing a, uh, a helium filled balloon and it'll lift your hair up a little bit. Those, that kind of strength is about how much we're talking about. Uh, but individually weak but collectively very strong so it holds the DNA molecule nicely tight together. And we have certain rules. Uh, Shargoff was a famous scientist and he figured out that the G's and C's always uh, sort of ratio together in A's and T's. So A's and T's will have, let's say you have 40% A's and T's and 60% G's and C's, or vice versa. So it has to add up to 100%. But he saw that ratio, which uh, at the time, that was quite interesting. And now it's like, mm, ho-hum, I already know that. But uh, nah, not so much. So uh, the DNA is a molecule. It stores information, consists of individual units called nucleotides, a sugar, phosphate group, and a nitrogen-containing base. DNA structure resembles a twisted ladder, uh, which the sugar and phosphate groups serving as backbones of the molecule and base pairs serving as the rungs. The sequence of the bases on one side of the ladder, like molecule, complements that of the other. Gee, and they're anti-parallel. So, genes are sections or regions of DNA that contain instructions for making proteins. Okay, these proteins have several functions. They can be all sorts of things. And we'll get more into that a little bit later. But for right now, just trust me on that. So DNA provides the instructions for virtually every type of, of building block we have in our bodies. And pretty much all organisms, I can not say pretty much all organisms that we know of right now, um, DNA is the universal code for all of life. And so the central dogma theory states DNA, RNA to a protein. And uh, there's only one exception to this rule as it stands right now, and that is the AIDS virus produces a, an enzyme called reverse transcriptase that takes uh, RNA and uh, creates DNA from it. And it's a, one of the exceptions, so that's why it's called the central dogma theory. It stands until we find exceptions, and we only found this exception so far. Now, it is an important one because I'll go ahead and tell you that uh, viruses are either DNA or RNA. They're never both. Well, one way around that, the AIDS virus uh, is an RNA virus but it cheats by using that reverse transcriptase so it can incorporate its genome into yours. Isn't that just lovely? We'll talk about the AIDS virus a little bit later on, but uh, I just thought I'd, I'd bring that up. Unpacking the genome is an organism's complete set of DNA. The chromosomes, one or more unique pieces of DNA, we'll talk about chromosomes, a gene is a specific sequence that we can find on the chromosome. So it's uh, uh, gene uh, is a sequence of DNA that contains information necessary for the production of a protein. A locus or a loci, now locus is one, loci are multiple. It's a position of a gene. So if you want to know where a gene is, it has a loci or a locus where it's positioned on the chromosome. And there's a naming protocol for that. We're not going to get into it, but I just want to let you know. And these are important terms, and, and please get familiar with those if you can. Uh, humans have 3 billion base pairs divided into 23 unique pieces of DNA. Now this is uh, 
uh, these are individual chromosomes and for humans they have a unique number 23 and they're pairs and they have unique shapes they have banding patterns and the like we'll talk about this in lab but I'll go ahead and show you here's a human chromosome uh, karyotype and this has an X and a Y which would be a male it would be two X's if it was female but you can see the little bands and all humans have the same sort of banding pattern if I were to look at dog DNA or whatever they would be in pairs and they have a different number and all those things uh, but they have unique banding patterns so uh, a karyotypist would uh, take blood and uh, from that do some techniques and then isolate the chromosomes and match them up now a lot of times they do that when um, a woman's pregnant and there may be some uh, biomedical reason why they want to do an amniocentesis. In other words, they want to get the DNA out of the slurry, so so to speak, of uh, the fluid that's in the uh, 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 the area can, around that baby, and they can take a sample. Then a karyotypist can now karyotype and make sure everything looks all right genetically. And so this would be normal, but there could be aberrations. Uh, there could be three of these chromosomes, number 21, and that's called trisomic 21, which is Down syndrome, and those sorts of things. We'll talk about that in lab, but uh, that's why what we're talking about is important because uh, the DNA uh, has 23 pairs, which means 46 chromosomes, and these are uh, what make us up. Now, uh, the variations between us, probably less than 2%. Uh, but never the, nevertheless, uh, with uh, three billion base pairs, uh, that's a lot of DNA. And uh, so anyhow, a gene is an instruction set for one particular molecule, usually a protein. It's an enzyme, let's say a gene in silk moss encodes for uh, fibroin, a chief component of silk, and the genes in humans that code for triglyceride lipase that breaks down dietary fat. A any word that ends with ASE, by the way, is an enzyme. So that really, it, it, and it's so great, I'm so grateful for the scientists doing this because now we recognize lipase, which breaks fat, uh, uh, lipo is fat, so this breaks down a fat, a triglyceride fat. So it tells you in the name of the enzyme what it does, which is really nice. I don't really, you know, if it was Dr. V's enzyme, it doesn't tell you anything to name enzymes after the people that find these things. It's better to have a systematic naming system, and they do, which I'm real grateful for. So here's some more vocabulary. Alleles are different versions of a gene that code for the same sort of feature. So what, what means like a color of a flower, the different colors could be different allelic forms. So orange petal, yellow, or purple. Uh, so that's allele. A trait is any single characteristic or feature. In other words, the color of that petal would be its trait. And there are several different colors uh, attributed by the alleles. I hope you see that. Of course, we have pairs, so only two alleles can be present in an organism at any one time, and one may be dominant or recessive, or whatever. We'll get into that later. So, individuals sometimes have slightly different instruction sets for a given protein, and these instructions can result in a different version of the same characteristic. These alternate versions are called alleles, and you can see a position, a loci, uh, on this particular chromosome. Here's the allele for that particular eye color. This one's blue and this one's for brown. Brown tends to dominate over blue. So if you had two blues, then you would have blue eyes. If you have two browns, you'd have brown eyes. And you have one brown and one blue, you'd still have brown eyes. And that's sort of the chemical characteristics based on the chemistry and the genetics uh, for this uh, characteristic. So a single characteristic feature of an organism uh, is referred to as a trait. It's a simple hy hypothetical example um, is the color of a daisy's petal is a trait. The instructions for producing the trait are found in, in a gene that controls that color. So this gene may have different alleles within the population. One allele may specify the trait of orange while another may be yellow and then there may be but you can only uh, 
have two of these representations and it may be the same so they, they would be uh, considered the same or they may be different and they of course have names for that but we're not going to worry about that right at this moment so fruit flies which we had to do in genetics when I was at state uh, the uh, Drosophila melanogasters may carry instructions for producing red eyes while another slightly different allele may have instructions for brown eyes and uh, you can uh, look at that uh, at some point so there's an experiment we do in, in the lab looking at uh, cleft chins and widow peaks these are autosomal certain traits that you may have and it's really interesting to kind of sample within the classroom uh, what uh, different students have and but these are uh, dominant versus recessive type traits that we can easily see that have one gene that's responsible for these traits so uh, anyhow I thought it was interesting so DNA is universal language it provides the instructions for building all of, uh, structures in living things. The full set of DNA in an organism is called a genome. In bacteria or prokaryotes, DNA occurs in circular pieces. And uh, we do have cells that have that, uh, the mitochondria. And if you were a plant, uh, the, uh, the, the genes that are responsible for photosynthesis um, will have a uh, circular. Eukaryotes in the genome is divided amongst smaller linear strands of DNA. All organisms' DNA pieces are generally called chromosomes. A gene is a sequence of bases in DNA molecule that carries information necessary for producing a functional product, usually a polypeptide or RNA molecule. So here's something really, really interesting, and it, it, it defies at first common sense. A fruit fly has a genome size of 180. If you look at an amoeba, which is just a blah, 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 right, amoeba, and it has over 600,000 uh, base pairs, and uh, wow, uh, hmm, why does it need so much DNA? If fruit fly has 180, it seems to be a little bit more, this one's got 600,000, what's going on here? So an onion has five times as much DNA in every cell as a human does. So what is it? Uh, the onions are more c complex organisms than we are? Gee, uh, it kind of goes against what I'm thinking. Um, the most complex species on the planet, which, you know, humans seem to be, I, I guess that's debatable, um, but uh, most uh, would be more complex than an onion. Comparing to the amount of DNA present in various species in terms of both numbers of chromosomes and base pairs, however, the paradox there does not seem to be any relationship between the size of the organism's genome and the organism's complexity. What turns out is that there are control elements and features within of the DNA that turn on and turn off and so you can have more complexity and as a result of the genetic complexity have more genetic diversity. In other words, you can make different products from the same sort of set of genes. And this tends to blow the minds of students. But think of it is, if you're going to have DNA, and it may have multiple uses for that particular region. So one gene may be derived from a region of DNA, and another gene could be derived from that same region of DNA. Uh, but it's done by regulatory mechanisms of turning on and turning off certain genes and that sort of thing. So uh, not having the large number of DNA bases, it's what you do with the genetics that you have. And there's high level of control mechanisms or control elements that can uh, make the DNA more efficient uh, in terms of its use. So here's some uh, differences between structural genes and regulatory genes. A gene that codes for an RNA or protein product other than a regulatory factor. A regulatory gene is a gene involved in controlling the expression of one or more genes. So here we get into some of the differences that are responsible for like an onion versus a human or a uh, Drosophila is uh, we, we may have more sophistication on the regulatory side and the structural so we can do more with the DNA or our, our ultimately the RNA uh, that we have. So 
encodes for proteins, encodes for transcription factors, encodes for messenger RNAs, ribosomal RNAs, and transfer RNAs. Uh, in regulatory genes, they encode for regulatory RNAs, and these are the small uh, RNAs, uh, the uh, uh, miRNAs or siRNAs. And there's more, believe me, there's a lot more to it. Gene products have either structural functional importance where it regulates the expression of genes. Uh, examples LAC-Z, which is a lactose uh, operon, uh, are structural genes that uh, make up uh, various things for uh, processing lactose. And some of the mutations could cause lactose intolerance, by the way. But uh, regulatory genes is a lac uh, I gene and the uh, cap protein or, or the cap uh, gene are part of the regula regulation of turning on and turning off the lactose operon based on if you have too much lactose or not enough or all these sorts of things and we'll talk about it but you can see the, the real difference uh, what we're talking about between a human and uh, let's say E. coli uh, so the percentage of coding DNA found in various organisms. So we have a lot of regulatory types of activities going on in our genome because that's high level. You think of it, it we're very efficient. Now all things are efficient. And e. coli, I always say, is a lean, mean fighting machine. But the percentage of DNA codes for proteins is much greater than that of Homo sapiens. And because uh, we use the regulatory genes to fine-tune a huge genome that we have and with a hundred trillion cells that differentiate in various other types of cells it starts to become too overwhelming it boggles the mind of all the things that have to be done I was taught that a lot of the extra DNA was called junk DNA well that turns out to be a misnomer and without going into too much details, it just makes me feel bad that uh, I bought that hook, line, and sinker. But anyhow, uh, it is what it is. So in eukaryotic species, DNA present far exceeds the amount necessary for code. And they said, well, this huge proportion of uh, sequences don't code for proteins. Well, we do know now that junk DNA is really a lot of regulatory uh, uh, materials that are going on in codes for uh, these active RNA type species but before junk DNA boy that ages me that proves that I have socks older than most of you out there but anyhow 1972 I remember it well um, and I was sitting in class in junk DNA I graduated high school in 78 but I remember that I used to take a lot of biology courses uh, human genome is published revealing few, uh, fewer genes to produce 2001 ENCODE to evaluate the role of DNA outside of genes. ENCODE releases papers in 2007 and it's ongoing. So you can see the research is showing that the junk DNA is not really junk DNA. So non-coding DNA uh, versus coding DNA is, is quite interesting. Uh, so bacteria and viruses genes make up 90% more of DNA. Eukaryotes, except for yeast, have a large amount of non-coding DNA, which is regulatory. And when we have this concept of introns, which are intervening sequences, non-coding regions within genes. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk more of this concept. And uh, uh, so uh, again, bacteria and viruses tend to have very a little non-coding. Uh, but non-coding regions of DNA often take in the form of sequences that are repeats. Sometimes thousands or even hundreds of thousands of these repeating sequences. Uh, but the uniqueness of this editing, this intervening sequences versus the exons where are excised to make the functional gene. You can see what they call the pre-mRNA is really, uh, of course, it would have a DNA equivalent, but the messenger RNA is further processed only in eukaryotes. So you, all these exons uh, are excised out of the intervening sequences and built in this protein coding region. Now, if you were to have different regions in here that may be built, uh, that would be a regulatory type function. So you could have different genes here as a result of this this uh, matrix of pre-mRNA, but I don't want to get too much into that. I just want you to see that there's editing that goes on at the messenger RNA level that uh, reduces the size uh, 
and uh, re remove some of the intervening sequences that are not required and we call this RNA splicing and uh, so you can see this is ready for uh, translation so we have a cap and a tail and that's these are just repeats that protect the message uh, messenger RNA and the cap that begins the process of the protein synthesis and we'll talk about that but it's really it's amazing the system so non-coding DNA consists of gene fragments that duplicate versions of genes and pseudogenes sequences that are uh, evolved from actual genes but accumulated mutations and made them lose their ability 20% of non-coding regions occur within genes, which is the case of called introns. 75% of the non-coding regions occur between genes. And some say it's a befuddling factor, so mutations can hit some of these non-coding regions and uh, the, the, it increases the survivability of the organism. The repetitive uh, DNA there's some cinnamons, uh, there's uh, SSRs, which are simple sequence repeats, or STRs, which we're going to talk about in uh, PCR technology. Uh, we use uh, uh, repeating uh, type of structures, uh, regions for, uh, like when we introduced having that uh, uh, legal case, we were freeing a gentleman from prison. So uh, and we'll talk more about that, but repetitive DNA can be divided into two classes, a tandem repeat, uh, and you can see CTGA, it's just repeating, this one's got four, this one's got two, uh, one to nine of them is called a micro sa uh, satellite, and if it's less than ten, it's called a mini satellite. Um, I mean it's greater than ten, excuse me, mini satellite. Ma micro is, is up to ten. And so, it, no, nomenclature. But the the key to all of this is the introns, which are handled by certain editing proteins, uh, excise out these intervening sequences to make the mature RNA, and off we go. So, um, really straightforward. Don't make it more complex than it is. It just simplifies the message so that we have uh, a complete, uh, uh, smaller, uh, lean mean uh, set of genes. Yeah, I just made that up. Uh, in the end, the presence of non-coding DNA is still not completely understood. The recent evidence reveals that non-coding DNA does encode extremely short RNA molecules that function in gene regulation. There's the key right there. Uh, RNA has a lot more of a role than we ever suspected back when I was in school in 1978 and on. Uh, how much today we know that... Uh, uh, RNA can do a lot of things, interfering, interference, RNA, all sorts of things. When genes are turned on or off, it can be a volume knob. It can regulate how much is being expressed and all that. And that would have been labeled as junk DNA in my day, which is now uh, these little short uh, RNA pieces. So in summary, only a small fraction of DNA in eukaryote uh, species uh, is in genes that code for proteins. Most of this are regulatory types of things. We're still trying to understand it, but the key word for the day uh, is RNA. RNA seems to have a huge role in our structure and function of, of humans and eukaryotes and higher organisms. So that's where I'm going to stop and I'll pick up next time on going over how genes actually work and an overview of that. And I will see you then. I'll be be uh, safe and until that time.